Well now on this series of our island heritage we've moved in the Manx Museum into the Natural Life Gallery and we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Larch Garrard. Can we say welcome indeed? Thank you for joining us on the programme. Well you're very welcome to the Manx Museum and particularly to the Natural History Gallery. Could I ask you now um, where we would start in here? The Ice Age I saw as soon as we walked in and this of course we talked on an earlier programme to Mr. Marshall Coven about that was the sort of the earliest time or just after that that man was found in the island. Well, the earliest thing illustrated here, of course, is much, much older in terms of geology, and in human terms, it means very little. We have got examples of the rocks found on the island, and we try and explain the shape and form of the island as it is today, and how the rocks formed. Mm. Now, could you give us some examples? You know, you have a, a wonderful display here of, uh, you're the expert, aren't that why we've come to talk to you, and our listeners, I'm sure, are very interested in this. Well, at the moment we have a temporary display on the fossils found in the Scarlet area. These are the sea creatures of many millions of years ago. They lived in warm seas and there are various sorts of sea urchin and of things like a nautilus which swam upside down with their shell in their arms and uh, all sorts of marine creatures and in fact a fossil coral reef. How has the island changed, you know, from the, the Ice Age, prior the Ice Age and, and, and since? Well, before the Ice Age, the sea coast will have been along the line of the Sulby Hills. The Sulby Glen will have gone more or less straight out to sea. And all the northern plain is the gift of the Ice Age. And when the human beings first arrived here, we think the island was by then covered by trees. And we have, in fact, got an illustration, our so-called geological column. And we have the evidence from the peat deposits. We have the leaf of the mountain dryas, the avens, which is preserved in peat from Michael. And somebody's now doing research on beetles, on the Michael cliffs. And of course, we have our great elk, or uh, great deer, Irish elk, which was the creature which was dug up in a marl pit near St. John's, and we have some illustrations related to this in the Natural History Gallery. Yeah. That's one mammal you've mentioned, but um, looking around the gallery here, there are many, many more. Perhaps uh, you'd like to talk about some of these. Well, of course, that particular mammal probably was extinct in the Isle of Man long before human beings arrived. We don't know very much about the early history of mammals in the island. For example, we know now we have no foxes and badgers, but it's perhaps possible we did in the past have foxes and badgers. We may have had polecats, though all we have now are things we call polecat ferrets. These are very much of the polecat type. They have dark eyes, dark coats. They're not the albino ferret, but we think they were probably introduced to hunt the rabbits, and the rabbits were probably brought in about the 13th century and were introduced on the calf of man. Shall we move on to birds, I think, because um, this really, there's a tremendous display of uh, the birds. There's something on my left I know that we're coming back to, because I think that would be the highlight uh, of the gallery. But the, the number of birds that, that you have here, um, how many species of birds are there in the island? That must be a difficult question. It's, well, it's an impossible question to answer. I've just picked up the current bird report, and I discover we now can add the little ringed plover to the Manx mm. list. It's been seen on the calf. Mm. We, have, we claim examples of all the birds to be found commonly in the island, the exception being the collared dove, which is a new arrival. But there must literally be hundreds of um, species found here all the time, apart from the ones that come perhaps just for the summer. Well, there are about a hundred, perhaps, as permanent residents, mm. but we have a good many more who do come through either in the summer or summer and uh, visitors, win uh, passage migrants, winter visitors, and we have one or two which are rather interesting and unusual. Mm. Perhaps you'd like to mention those in particular. Well, one of our highlights, of course, is the chuff, the red-legged king of the crows. And this is a bird which is now very rare in the British Isles. There are a few in Western Ireland and a few in some of the Scottish islands. But only in the Isle of Man can they said to be fairly common still, apart from a few in Wales. And our crows are unusual. Uh, it's usually said in England, if you see a lot of 
uh, crows to gather their rooks. Well, in the Isle of Man, they've got to be rooks because our crows are the hooded crows. They have grey backs. Uh, they are perhaps a little too common, like the magpies, which is another very common bird now in the island. Can we move around and just have a look at some more of them? Because I say this is possibly you seem to have more birds on display in, in this particular gallery than anything else. Yes. Well, we do like to have the birds mm. so that people can have assistance in identification. Mm. And here we have everything from the smallest bird in the Isle of Man, the little tiny far crest wren, mm. and also a very large bird, the snowy owl. Now, these were, in the 19th century, apparently fairly common winter visitors. Mm. We're rather hoping they may come back they're now breeding in Fettler again, and in fact there were reports early in October of a bird which sounds very like a snowy owl in the Crosby area. Yeah. Now really, the, you know, the size of birds, they do vary so much, but even the smallest can travel many thousands of miles, can't they? Which bird do we have on the island that perhaps has the longest journey to get here? Well, we did have the old British record for a gold crest wren, which went 100 miles. And when you think that it's about as long as your finger joint, mm. it was a great journey. Mm. And looking again at the Calf of Man Birds report, we have, for example, blackbirds, which come and go from Scandinavia. We have both blackbirds which go to Denmark and blackbirds which come from Denmark. Uh, one which was ringed in Jutland uh, in the spring, in April of 1974, turned up in the winter passage uh, the same year on the calf. Yeah. This, of course, is the main bird sanctuary where all the birds who visit the island are ringed the calf, is it? Well, it's one of the main ringing centres of the island. It is, of course, maintained by the National Trust as a bird observatory. Mm -hmm. We might say more about its work a little later on. Yes. Let's move down, Cameron, because um, above our heads, if we can just go off birds for a moment, I think, is again, it's something that everyone who has been to the museum will always remember. This is the, the whale, of course. This is the famous Langness whale, and he's the only complete articulated skeleton of a Rudolph's Rockwell in the British Isles, oh. or so I'm assured. Yeah. And the bones alone weigh four and a half tons. He came alive onto the shore at Langness, but unfortunately these big sea mammals, when they launch on the shore, can't breathe, their own weight kills them. Mm. And he was towed round onto Derby Haven shore with a tr by a trawler, and then brought into Douglas behind three steam traction engines, buried for ten years to get the, the bones clean, and then mounted here in the new Natural History Gallery. Yes. Well, how long is, uh, has he been there? Um, he's been here since the gallery was built, which was just before the war, about 1939. Mm. But in fact, he came ashore rather earlier in the museum's history. Yeah. If we could move on then, because as I say, I think that's one thing that every youngster who's been to the museum certainly uh, knows. Um, gardens and uh, butterflies and uh, I notice also um, the beaches. This is all part of the gallery, isn't yes. it? Yes. We have, again, all the butterflies you're likely to find in the Isle of Man, a very short list. Partly as a result of the Ice Age, all the wildlife in the island now has come in since the Ice Age, and quite a lot of species have never made it back to the island. And we do have displays showing the sort of wildlife you might find in your garden, in the hope of encouraging people to make gardens more suitable for their wildlife. Yeah. Well, what sort of advice would you give um, people on this? Well, at this time of year, in the winter, Feeding the wild birds, of course, is quite a good idea. And if you can bear to have your garden look untidy, leave some of the things to seed so that there are seeds for the seed-eating birds to feed on. Fine. Well, that uh, certainly is a good idea because winter is uh, coming fast with us. You mentioned earlier the work of the uh, National Trust, and we're moving down the gallery now to the display, which I think concerns us directly. Well, this group of displays, which, are new, uh, which is in fact a new group, is concerned with the National Trust properties. Really, at the moment, we've been acquiring them so fast that it's very difficult to keep our publicity on them up to date, so we thought we'd show you the wildlife of them. Uh, we've mentioned the Calf of Man, the islet off the south of the island, and this was acquired by the English Nas National Trust for England and Wales, and we now manage it as a bird observatory and we have the large areas of Spanish head and the chasms, mackled head bruise, and a small area, the Balakesh airs, of this unique wildlife habitat in the north of the island. And we've got the birds of the Trust properties, the peregrine falcon, the thing which was once paid as a fee by the Lord of Man to the English king on his coronation. We have owls, 
more chaffs, of course, and the commonest bird of prey, the kestrel. Mm. I notice also taking a pride of place in this display here is the, uh, the little grey seal. Well, this rather pathetic soul, uh, in fact, died at Port Erin after uh, an unfortunate accident. Mm. But uh, there is a breeding colony on the calf, and they seem to have come back since the 19th century. Uh, one of the National Trust properties is called Gobnirona, which means the point of the seals. But there were no seals off the island for many years. Then they turned up again. Now they're breeding quite happily on the calf. So history is repeating itself there. And we hope we can maintain this sort of improvement. Our shearwaters have come back to breed on the calf. Again, they have been vanished for many years. Well, I mentioned earlier in our walk around that there was a display case on my left we were coming back to, to uh, talk about, and th this is really the Manx part, I suppose, the Manx cat and the, the Lochthan sheep. Well, two representatives of the unique domestic animals of the island and the Lockton sheep, which has four horns and is darkish brown in colour, probably came here with the Celtic people and may have been spread further by the Vikings. There are very similar sheep in central Sweden as well as up the Western Isles, the rest of the Sudres. And, of course, we have our Manx cat, a very poor specimen. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you straight away, because there are so many tales of how the Manx cat became to be tailless, crossed with a rabbit, sort of late getting on the ark, and Noah chopped its tail off. Is the, the, there must be a real reason for the Manx cat. Well, it seems to be some sort of developmental freak, just as you sometimes get cats which have extra toes. And expert opinion now says that it probably evolved in the 18th century, but the Isle of Man may well have got its cats in the Viking period. The, num the, the statistics suggest that our population is similar to the cat population of Iceland, a high percentage of white and ginger cats, very few blotched tabbies. And this may mean that the ancestors of the Manx cat came here in the Viking period, but we can't prove that tailless cats existed before the 18th century. Mm. But certainly I think they're one of the most fascinating things that people like to look at, don't they? Oh, they're great fun, and they make very nice pets. <laughs> Dr. Gower, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the series. Thank you for having me. Well, now on this programme, we've moved into the library and archives, and we welcome to the series um, the lady in charge of this department, Miss Anne harris Nan. Nice to have you on the programme. Oh, thank you very much. Um, let's talk about archives first, because archives to me means hundreds of years ago. Um, I I is this the, the right interpretation of the word as you have it? Yes. Well, they are documents produced mm. in uh, administration by in work or your private capacity. Yeah. And, you know, they stretch back to the... 14th century. Yeah. What's the earliest uh, you have? Well, the earliest uh, document in the library mm. is a grant of land in Glen Farber mm. in 1376, and it was given to us quite recently by the Earl of Derby. Mm. So that's really the treasure, is it? The very oldest. Well, that is the oldest, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Th there must be a really, uh, I mean, the history of the Isle of Man for what, um, some 600 years all stored away in there? Yes, it is. I think we know we contain the basic authorities for all the history. Yeah. yeah. What about newspapers? Um, you know, do, do you have records of these? Yes, we have all the newspapers printed in the Isle of Man, and these start in 1793 mm. and continue right to the present day. So ev every paper that's printed in the island you have? Uh, well, we hope, yes. We haven't got absolutely every copy, no. but we hope to have a virtually every copy of every Manx yeah. newspaper. Now, now, to me, that's working back 200 years, and the number of papers that are printed, you know, it would take uh, almost the museum itself. Do you, do you have them uh, on microfilm, or do you have them as newspapers? Well, we do have them as newspapers, mm. of course, but to safeguard them, we have them many series of the most used ones mm. on microfilm, mm. and we ask students to use these mm. for safety's sake. Yeah. Mm. Now, when you say newspapers, you have the specialist forms, like the TT special, if anyone was interested in TT history, have you got all those papers? Yes, we have those, and we've got the green final, and we've had a lot of football club research, actually, mm. on these very papers. Yes. Mm. This would be the, the Colby book. That's for the right, yes, yes, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to move on to more general things now, possibly the library, um, do you again have every Manx book or bo or they just books printed in the Isle of Man or, or about the island? Well, we try to have every book about the Isle of Man, whether it's printed in the island or not, but we also have every book uh, printed in the Isle of Man, published mm. in the Isle of Man. Yeah. Who do you find use at the library most? Uh, you know, you would think possibly in the first instance as students, but I would imagine that uh, it is open to anyone who wants to come along and sort of look anything up, is mm. it? Yes, it is absolutely open to anyone at all. Mm. 
and we have you know a great range of people who use it we have children of course who use it school children um, and we do have many students in university lectures etc but private individuals come in to find something about the history of their house their fields um, their families of course yes. this is a very big interest I was going to ask you that yes, the family yes, trees side of that's things. right yes yeah. Uh, especially in the summer when we get a lot of visitors, yeah. Americans, Australians returning. Yeah. We do very big business that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular sort of um, book or series of books about the island yourself that you uh, would recommend to anyone who sort of comes in to, to learn quickly about the island? Uh, well, we do have the standard works um, at in, in the reading room and people can browse through these. Yeah. Uh, there's a few basic histories and tours and guides and yeah. we can make these readily available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You obviously uh, know a lot about the island being in charge of this department. Well, it, uh, it, it creeps up on you over the years. You <laughs> absorb it and it comes out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, you, you, you obviously are adding to it all the time. This must be a tremendous um, problem of space. Yes, there is, of course. And in fact, we've had an extension a few years mm. ago. Uh, we're putting things in like sliding shelving yeah. to get the maximum storage. But of course, we go on collecting and naturally uh, one runs out of space yeah. in time. Yeah. Mm. A final point, Anne, I'm mm. sure if uh, any of our listeners have any old books that uh, they're about to throw out that may be of interest, mm. you'd only be too pleased to hear from them, whether you have copies or not. Exactly, <laughs> anything like that, any old photographs, any uh, any old document they're not interested in, if they mm. want our advice, we'll always give that. Yeah. We'd like to see anything, you know, in that nature. Yeah, mm -hmm. You'd rather have a hundred false alarm calls and then miss one genuine article. Yes, this is it, absolutely, yes. And thank you very much indeed. Mm, thank you. Well, no programme on our island heritage would be complete without talking about our own Manx language and uh, what the expert we're talking to on this today on the programme is Walter Clark. Welcome back to the series. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, where did the Manx language come from? We've traced, you know, in previous programmes the where man arrived in the island. Where, where did the actual language come from? Well, the language that originally came with the Celtic peoples when the Celtic tribes came up through the Mediterranean into Europe, um, they crossed the channel and originally they were one tribe, if you like, one people. They in turn divided themselves into two groups, the Brythonic group, which is basically the Welsh, Cornish and Breton people, and the Gordelic group, which is the Manx, Irish and Scottish people and it became two languages and then they in turn divided again into the six Celtic countries so you get Brittany, Wales and Cornwall Man, Scotland and Ireland and the language that Mang says it's spoken today is almost, you could almost say it was a, a dialect of Irish and Scottish Celtic. There yeah. are three uh, dialects, yeah. very similar in sound. Yeah. Could you give us a sort of an example mm. of how they are so similar? Yes, we over in Man, when we in the island, when we meet anyone, we greet them. We say Kenestashu, how are you? In Scotland, they say Kamrahashu. In Ireland, they say Conestatu. So you get Kenestashu, Conestatu, Kamrahashu all sounding very similar as if they're a dialect of the one language. So Whereas you as a, as a Manx Gaelic speaker could hold a conversation with a Scottish Gaelic or an Irish Gaelic speaker oh yes. very easily? Yes, we meet quite a lot of visitors in the summer who speak either Scots or Irish Gaelic. Um, it depends wha what part of the country they come from. For Irish, for instance, uh, in uh, northern the northern part of Ireland, it's much easier for us to understand them and them to understand us than people say from Cork, where instead of saying Conestatu, they say Cahawiltu, which is yet another dialect of Irish Gaelic, yeah. you see. But, but this, this group is, is completely different to the, the, the Breton and the... the oh, the yes, yes, indeed, yes. Whereas we say Canastashu, how are you? In Wales, of course, they say Simaihedu, which is, sounds completely different, yeah. you see. Yeah. Well, what's the interest in, in the Manx language now in the island? I believe more and more people are starting to, to, to take it up. Oh yes, there's a great interest at the mm. moment. The classes are going very well indeed in all parts of the island. A lot of people use Manx now. Uh, I use it very frequently both on the phone in writing to people and meeting people socially in the evenings. Uh, the classes are going very well, the students are very keen and um, there's quite a strong revival. Yeah. Is it a difficult language to, to learn, you know, compared to people who they, they learn French or Spanish or this sort of mm. thing? Is Manx difficult? No, I don't think so. If you have an aptitude for languages, mm. of course, it makes it much easier. But mm. I was fortunate that there were 
somewhere in the region of 18 of the old native speakers still alive when I started and I had the opportunity of going out with them uh, pestering them if you like but yeah. trying to live with them and um, it was a great advantage, mm. very great advantage indeed. But we made a series of tape recordings from all these old people and um, which are now available to all the students so that um, pronunciation-wise mm. they can uh, really get cracking on yeah. it. Th there are mm. books of course on the Manx language there but you really need to talk to someone to get the correct pronunciation, do, yeah. don't you? Well the colloquial speech, mm. yes you do, because um, the way it's written, now for instance you get a word which means you say I believe that was right, mm. or I think it was right if you like. It's spelled C-R-E-D-J-A-L. Mm. To look at it you think, oh, credul, mm. but the old Manx people would say Tamikral and they slurred it in its yeah. colloquial speech, you see. Um, here again, the little differences in the north and the south and the west of the island, uh, from a dialect point of view, in the north we say cown for head. Mm. In the south it's kion, and in peel in the west it's kjotten, mm. an intrusive D. So you get three different dialects, even in the island. There was obviously a fourth on the eastern side, but because of the tourist influence, if you like, or the earlier outside influence, that's gone completely, yeah. you see. But mm. it, it is sort of on the up and up, the Manx Oh, language. very much so, very much indeed. Yeah. And we have frequent what we call a Gilgax, uh, Manx evenings, where we meet for a drink and a talk, and uh, you don't hear any English at all spoken yeah. there. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, Walter. Perhaps you'd like to sort of say cheerio to our listeners in Manx Gaelic. Oh, sledden you as frail and gilgol. Well, we move now into the art gallery here at the Manx Museum, and um, with me again is Mr. Marshall Cubbon, the director. Um, I must say, I think, in fairness to our listeners, that we are talking about the art gallery as we see it now, when this program is being recorded. It could, in fact, alter during the winter months by the time it is broadcast. Yes, that's true. The, the, the art gallery is um, the section of the museum that uh, changes most quickly. Um, um, a, we, we, we tend to change the pictures that are on display from our own collections anyway. Um, and secondly, especially during the winter months, and this is really aiming at catering for the, the Manx public, as was mentioned at the very first program, uh, during the winter months we tend to bring over travelling exhibitions or arrange special exhibitions ourselves, which um, inevitably bring about a complete change in the, in the display in, in the art gallery. Um, but uh, at present it has what might be regarded as a, a fairly typical display drawing on our own Manx Museum collections. Perhaps you'd like to mention some of the ones that are here at the moment. Yes, well, in, in common with, with the whole of the institution, of course, the, the art collections are, all have a Manx uh, association. Mm. This has been the collection policy of the Manx Museum right from the start, so that all our permanent pictures are either um, Manx in their subject matter or they are the work of Manx artists. And normally um, there are three local artists that are usually um, represented in, in the display. There is um, uh, John Miller Nicholson, the, the grandfather of the present John Nicholson, um, um, Archibald Knox and William Hoggart. And uh, at uh, present there is um, a little bay uh, devoted to um, a representative selection of p pictures by each of these three artists. Mm. The, the Nicholsons, of course, include a few scenes um, from Venice, because uh, John Miller Nicholson went uh, to Venice and uh, did some very fine work both there and indeed painted other pictures back here in the Isle of Man from, his, uh, uh, from the notes that he, he made when, when he was there. Mm. Uh, Archie Knox um, is represented by a series of watercolours. Mm. Uh, they are very distinctive, in, particularly in their treatment of skies. He was a very rapid painter, and this gave him the, um, the, the ability to, to capture light and, and cloud movement. Um, uh, in in uh, Knox, of course, uh, was one of the leading designers for the firm of Liberty in the great Art Nouveau period. In fact, his work has just recently featured in the big uh, Liberty exhibition that's been mounted at the Victorian Albert Museum in, in London. 
Um, so outside the Isle of Man you find Archibald Knox quite well known as a designer, but here in the island we tend to think of him perhaps primarily as, as a watercolour painter, and um, we have a selection uh, on show. Uh, many of the Manx scenes, but not all Manx, of yeah. course, he painted in the south of England when he was working there too. And I may say the wrong thing here, but a collection that does really impress me uh, is in that corner there, which are all Manx scenes. Yes, it's a very fine series, and they're in fact all, all in their contemporary frames, which mm. adds to the interest. It is in fact a series of 26 watercolours of the island, done in 1795 by uh, John Warwick Smith. Uh, it was uh, specially commissioned by the then Duke of Athol, and uh, they were um, purchased by a generous private benefactor uh, from the Athol family, oh, perhaps 20 years or so ago now. And perhaps a final word on one of your latest acquisitions. Well, yes, in the, the centerpiece of the far wall, it uh, has the four uh, Taubman portraits that uh, were purchased at uh, Christie's uh, last year, early last year. Three of them, in fact, by Ramney. Uh, they're very fine 18th century portraits. The two center ones, I think, are particularly splendid Ramneys. Um, splendid examples of the high period of Ramney's portraiture. Yeah, they really do give a, almost a, a three-dimensional effect, don't they? they yes, yes, they, 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 they are splendid pictures and they really do um, uh, grace the, the, the art gallery here. And it's, it's, it's marvellous to think that there was this great challenge and, and the island and, and the Manx Museum managed to acquire all of them for the national collections. We've now moved into the map room and I'm sure that everyone uh, who's been to the Manx Museum, whether they're recently or as youngsters, will remember the marvellous model which has always been a centrepiece. I know when I walked through the doors, I said, well, I've seen that many times before. <laughs> yes, it is a favourite and uh, it does enable you to get a sort of aerial view of the Isle of Man without the trouble of going up in an aeroplane. Yes. <laughs> and it does give a graphic picture of just what the, the actual topography, the... the, the landscape of, of, of the island is, is like. Mm. But you also have a very fine collection of early maps, don't you? Yes, this room is also used to display uh, just a selection, really, from this magnificent collection that's housed in the, in the library here. And um, it uh, goes, really, from the Ptolemy map of uh, um, over the early 16th century through to the first Ordnance Survey map of the 1870s. Um, uh, it is a very comprehensive series and it's most interesting to see how uh, the shape of the island uh, ch has changed, in the, at least in the, in the map maker's eye, although the shape on the ground hasn't changed, of course. No. I notice you also have here um, Douglas Town plans, for instance, plans of Douglas, and I'm sure you can, people can learn from that how the, how the town itself has grown. Yes, so the, there are an interesting series of early, early town plans, in particular the ones of Douglas show the remarkable changes that took place in the, well, in the 1860s and 70s in particular with the construction of the promenades and the driving through of Victoria Street and so on that completely changed the geography of the town. And of course some very fine prints. Yes, yes. Uh, again, it's just a small selection of, of uh, uh, a large collection, mm -hmm. and we have some early topographical pictures. The, this series by Moses Griffiths of 1774 gives a picture of the island uh, in the days long before photography. Mm. Fine, that's the map room, and I'm sure that uh, we wouldn't... Uh, be fair to complete a program at the Manx Museum without standing in the T.E. Brown Room. No, well, that, that's true. This is another favourite uh, corner of the Manx Museum. Um, not all that many museums have a poet's corner, but the Manx Museum does have one to the uh, Manx poet uh, T.E. Brown. And you see there the uh, rather fine stained glass windows. They were designed by William Hoggart and um, they depict uh, characters and scenes from Brown's writings and of course he is uh, regarded as the national poet of the Isle of Man to the people who are not at home with Manx dialect some of the writing is perhaps a bit difficult yes. <laughs> but of course to, 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 to the Manx public um, the position of Brown is, is, is assured. Yeah. You certainly have a, a feeling of, of serenity just standing in the room, don't you? Well, yes. It's, uh, I've even had it 
uh, compare to a chapel. I don't know whether <laughs> this is quite right, but it, at least from, from a purely museum point of view, I, I think it, it gives a nice little break from going around the galleries, mm. peering into cases, reading labels, and absorbing a, an awful lot of fact. Mm. It, it's nice to have a room that just enables you to, to relax for a minute or two and uh, um, contemplate something of, of Brown's writings. There are um, quotations from some of his poems uh, displayed on each side of the stained glass windows. Fine. Well, that just about completes another program in the series of our Ireland Heritage. Can we say once again to you, Mr. Cobham, thank you indeed for sparing all the time, and we look forward to you joining us for the rest of the series. Thank you. (laughs)